and welcome to Splash. I'm your host, Della Rani, and we're coming to you live from the ABC studios here in Sydney. Today, we're joined by live studio audience with students from Kiriwi High School. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> so today, we're going to take you behind the scenes of the ABC newsroom and give you some tips as to how we report the news every single day. Now, to help me do this, I'm joined by two of ABC's top most journalists, Jeremy Fernandez and Jane Hutchin. Welcome. Oh, Thank thanks, you. Del. This will be fun. This is going to be great. Yeah. And I also just want to say we do have an ABC journalist who is online, Jemima Garrett. She's there to take any of your questions <laughs> as they come in. So a very warm welcome to all our online viewers as well. Okay, so let's begin. Why don't we start with you, Jeremy, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be where you are today. Well, I um, kind of fell into journalism a bit by accident. My dad used to be a journalist, a newspaper journalist, and I swore I would never, ever do the same thing. <laughs> um, long hours, um, lots of people getting angry at you um, mm. because they're never happy with what you're reporting, um, which is kind of a mark of success these days, I think. When no one's happy, then you know you're doing your job. <laughs> um, but I sort of fell into journalism. I started, um, I did a, a media studies sort of unit at school mm. um, when I was your age, and then um, sort of really enjoyed it, and then um, went to uni and studied uh, media and broadcasting, and then uh, got a job with ABC, oh, sorry, Channel 7. I was doing voiceovers for Channel 7. Okay. Uh, and then a bit with ABC Radio, then gradually moved into TV and moved into news and reporting. Um, and I found that it's a great job to travel with, so um, I stuck with it. And you clearly worked your way up to, to where you are today. Yeah, yeah. Look, I've, I've only been reading the news in Sydney for about um, sort of five years, um, but I've been with the ABC off and on for about 14, nearly 15 years. Wow. So um, I'm older than I look. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Jane, you've had quite an amazing career yourself. You're a foreign correspondent, now you present One Plus One. Tell us about sort of the adventures you've had along the way. Well, like Jeremy, I also had a, a father who was in newspapers and actually my mum was on newspapers and that's probably a clue as to how they met. Um, but I used to see my, um, my whole early life, a newspaper would come under the door and I used to define different ages by events that happened as I saw them on the newspaper as they came under the door. So that was really defining for me to sort of see the world as it came on this newspaper that my dad edited. I grew up in Hong Kong. And, uh, you know, I sort of thought my dad was away long hours as well. I thought this is not a good industry to get into. But I, I went on a children's TV show when I was quite young. And I remember I just couldn't wait to see whether I could see through the lens and see my mum and dad and everybody who was out there. And it was such a disappointment when I went on the TV show and they, I couldn't actually see them. But I, that, I, I think, kind of kept my interest in television as I went on. And I always thought I didn't want to do newspapers. I don't know why. I always enjoyed the medium of television. It is a very, very different medium. I want to give the studio audience now an opportunity to ask you guys some questions. We do have a question in the back there. So have there been any times where you regret um, becoming a journalist? Great question. It is a good question. Any Jeremy, I think you should answer that. Um, I think like every job, you have your sort of frustrations, you know, sort of day to day. And I don't kind of say that is, you know, just everyone has a kind of crap day and sometimes things are good, sometimes things, things are bad. The things that um, really affect me personally are when you, you know, there are some stories where you meet people and they're just sort of so incredible and they've been through something really horrible. And that's our, our job basically is to report on people who've had a really horrible day or having a really horrible time um, for whatever reason. And sometimes those stories really stick with you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure you guys will agree. And, and then you go home and you have nightmares and you think, I can't do this. I really, you know, um, you know, whether it's a plane crash or someone who's lost their child in a fire or a car crash or something like that. Um, but it's also the thing that keeps me going at the same time because I, I really like the exposure to what really kind of goes on in the world and I like informing other people of, you know, the good stuff that exists out there, but also a lot of the bad stuff and what we can sort of jointly do to fix it. Jane, what about yourself? Well, I, I've had those kind of moments as well, but basically the times I've probably regretted being a journalist is when I've met someone who's been doing something so amazing that I sort of think for two moments, oh, I would do anything 
to, to do that kind of job. And, you know, I've covered war zones. I've been in Iraq. I've covered um, Hurricane Katrina, the aftermath of that. I've been in really dangerous places. And sometimes you just meet people who are so incredibly brave and inspiring. It makes you sit back and think, well, all I do is I report on those amazing people. I'm not that amazing person. So those are probably the times when I wish I was not a journalist. Do we have any other questions from the studio at this stage for Jeremy or Jane? Oh, great. At the front? Yeah, go ahead. Um, when you go into, like, war zones and stuff, how do you know you're not going to get, like, shot at? Um, you do not know that you're not going to get shot at. Um, obviously, well, I normally work with a camera crew because I've been doing television mostly. We wear flak jackets, we wear helmets. They're not pretty. They're very heavy. Um, but you have to make a judgment about where you are and whether it's not just about your safety, it's about the team that you're with. You know, are you getting other people in danger because you perhaps selfishly want an element of news that maybe it would be safer not to get? So you have to make those kind of judgments um, as you're in them. I was in one situation in Israel where we literally had rockets whizzing over our head from a group in Lebanon. And uh, one of my friends, another journalist, said, do you know that when they fire those rockets, they have no way of knowing where they're going to land? And we were standing the, the ends where the rockets were going to be landing. And that thought all of a sudden made me feel extremely vulnerable, extremely scared, and, and we didn't stay in that location much after that. It goes without saying you have to be very passionate about what you do to be able to put yourself in that position, and passionate about the stories, about the, the stories of the people you're telling and the situation you're reporting on. But sane so, as well, because yeah. um, you're no good to anyone if you're not there. Absolutely. Well, we've had some questions online as well, and one of the most popular questions we've had has come from Tranby College. So, this is a bit of a lighter question. Do you guys write your scripts yourselves, and does someone give you food on your breaks? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go? Does anyone give you food? No one's ever brought me food. No. <laughs> um, I guess at the level that Jane and I work at as presenters, and you as well, Del, you're sort of working at a level where uh, you've got a whole lot of people working beside you, writing scripts, and you can see around the room today, you know, camera people, directors, um, sound technicians, um, and writing scripts is a part of that um, as well. So at the level that we work at, we sort of, I do write um, a few of my scripts, and you do as well, Jane. Um, a big part of the job, uh, for my job, um, is, is, uh, involves um, um, what we call sub-editing other people's work. So when they finish writing the script, they, they send it to us and we tighten it up and make it, you know, we, we check it for accuracy, we check that it's not um, legally or ethically um, difficult. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to, some people ask me, do I do my own research? And the answer is 100% yes. If I'm not actually doing the work to learn about my subject matters, to learn about the people I'm interviewing, how can I own that information? So it's really important I do all my own research, I write my own scripts, I let someone else have a look at them to make sure I haven't made any little errors anywhere along the lines. And um, yeah, sometimes I even buy coffee and sandwiches for my colleagues. <laughs> so it actually is the other way around. You're the one bringing food for the team. And it's true. I mean, it is a team effort. I think as presenters, sometimes it's easy for people to look at, look at you guys and say, oh, so you're the face and, you know, you're the voice. But, but there are a lot of people that do work behind the scenes. And, and we do not saying. look like this all the time. <laughs> let's, let's be honest. No. Just a couple of hours ago, it looked very That's different. Right. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, we have another, another winning online question. What, this one is from Mimi M. And uh, she's asked, do you face any danger when reporting on certain topics or events? Jane, let's start with you on this one. Well, as we were talking about a little bit earlier, there are occasions when you're in war zones, um, when you're in an area where you've gone to cover a disaster or an accident, where you're really, you're often walking around in places that are highly dangerous, where there might be no electricity. Um, you've got to constantly be vigilant and with local people, people who know those areas that you're traveling to. If you just happen to rock up, 
with your cameraman, you're, you're often at a disadvantage because you don't know the local area. So we make sure when we're traveling overseas is that we always have people with us who know, as we say, the lay of the land, who can listen to the local radio and say, hey, something happened here a while ago. Normally when that happens, it's time to get out. Um, on another occasion, this was in southern Iraq, just after the invasion, this is about 10 years ago now, um, we had gone through an area um, where a lot of people called Marsh Arabs lived. And apparently there, were, there was also a tribe there that used to uh, cut off the heads of their enemies and stick them on poles. And somebody told us this story as we were driving through and we thought, okay, well, we hope we're not the enemies. Uh, and when we got back to the hotel, we found all these journalists waiting for us and said, we heard that you interviewed people who cut off the heads of their enemies and stuck them on poles, is that right? And no, I, I just don't know how that information got back to them, but we had to tell them, no, we did not have those pictures and that was not what we were doing. So in short, yes, you have to be very aware of the dangers in whatever area you're going to. And Jeremy, recently you reported on the bushfires here in New South Wales. Before we sort of get you to talk a little bit about that, let's actually just take a quick look at that piece. Did you have time to save things? I mean, it, it must have been quite difficult to decide where to go first. It was, yeah. I, I came through the sliding door here. Uh, I was actually looking for my keys for the, for the motorbike and I... Um, they were on those bricks just there, because uh, between the two staircases, I, I, I couldn't see anything, I couldn't breathe. It was just so thick with smoke. So I'm fumbling around, fumbling around for the keys. Uh, I found the, the laptop computer, so I grabbed that and took it out instead. But you plan to come back, or does this make uh, you rethink the environment that you live in? Yeah, it's, it's always gonna be risky living here. We've known that forever. I do plan on coming back, of course, but, uh, the house, the new house will be definitely much more, uh, you know, it'll, it'll have a lot of um, fail subs built into it, like sprinklers and uh, fire, fireproof materials, so it should be a lot safer. So Jeremy, what was it like actually being there and sort of hearing the stories of these people that have obviously just gone through a very traumatic experience. It's a really ghoulish job and, and Jane will agree in sort of different contexts as well. Quite often, um, you know, when there's been a disaster of some sort, as journalists, we're one of the first people to get there. And so you find people who are really emotionally kind of still in shock and they're still coming to terms with what's happened to them. Um, and you want to be sensitive in the way you treat them and to make sure that you're not pushing them so hard that you, I mean, contrary to what a lot of people think, we're not going out there to make people cry so we can get the shot and all that kind of thing. It's, you have to really tread carefully because these people have got to go on rebuilding their lives long after we've disappeared. In that particular case, this guy was, um, he was just so incredibly welcoming and we, we spoke to him about, you know, the fact that he'd lost his house. He got a phone call while he was at work, 40, 50 minutes away, um, saying the house is on fire. His mum was alone at home at the time. Um, and they had to evacuate her and just watch the house burn down, basically, which is an incredibly traumatising thing to do. And what was incredible about this particular interview was that he actually gave us some pictures um, that he took with his mobile phone of his house burning down, um, and that was just incredibly powerful stuff. And that's very much speaks to the medium of, te medium of television. It was where you have got the pictures to match you know, what your script says and that kind of thing. And with the rise of, you know, mobile phones with cameras on them or social mm. media, there are a lot of people, there are a lot more pictures, a lot more access that we're yep. getting to things like this. Just in terms of covering that, I want to touch on a point that you made earlier, Jane, about also sort of the accuracy in reporting, you know, because especially in a situation like a bushfire where things are moving so quickly, how do you manage that situation where you've got people that are very emotional, very vulnerable, but then you've got an audience that's saying, give us information. Or perhaps, you know, people are tweeting and... So how do you, you know... Well, I think if you're live and you're talking to an audience about something that's unfolding, something that's developing, um, you have to kind of tell people that you're out and about. You might not have the absolute latest information, but this is the latest that you've been told. So you have to kind of be real about what you're conveying. If you're, if you're doing um, a television 
television package that is putting information that you know you're going to prepare a bit later, um, what I try to do is I try not to put any hard and fast facts into stuff I do at the time so that I can add that in later to make sure I've got the most up-to-date stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to I try to convey the emotion, I suppose, and the atmosphere of a story if I'm um, shooting pictures and preparing information to use um, later when I get back to the office. And I think, you know, you were talking earlier about having a father as a newspaper, but how you love the TV medium, and that's especially true when you're working in television. We're dealing with pictures, you know, so it is sort of pertinent to turn around and point things out or, or sort of use that to exp to deliver that message. Jane, now I want to talk to you about your show, One Plus One, where you get to interview a lot of high profile individuals. Um, before we get into some interviewing techniques, let's actually take a look at one of Jane's recent interviews. So perhaps my question you might think would have been quite typical of a news journalist. Is that kind of your problem in a sense with the news industry, that it's after a glib uh, portrayal of the world? Um, I think the news industry is so varied in many ways that there are some wonderful journalists out there doing amazing work and doing what I think the news industry should do, which is to give us all the information that we need to flourish as individuals and as collective societies. That's what the job of the news is. Um, but if you actually switch on the news any day of the week, you'll also find, as it were, news that's not performing as well as it might. News that we think is not helping me to understand anything. It's not helping life to go better. I don't really know what I've been doing, spending the last hour watching this. I don't, you know, this hasn't enriched mankind in any way, right? I think we have to accept that. And so my question in writing my latest book was to ask a very simple quasi-philosophical question, which is, what is news ideally? If, if you didn't have to worry about money and legacy broadcasters and the systems that are in place and the satellites that are already there, if you could just wipe the slate clean and ask yourself a simple question, what would we ideally need from the news? That was the question that I was asking myself. And yes, you know, I'm quite idealistic because I think, I think that news and news gathering has a really important part to play in democracies, uh, but I think it's in many ways going wrong. But is it useful for the news industry to, to constantly enrich? Well, I don't think the news, uh, uh, there is a strand of, of opinion that says things like, the news is too negative, so all the news needs to do is to get more cheerful about life. I, I, I don't agree with that at all. I think it's really important for the news to pick up on the genuine faults of a nation, but also pick up on its virtues. So it needs to do both. It's not good news versus bad news. It's really the national interest. Now, Jane, I thought that was a particularly interesting interview because here's a person that's highly critical of the news business. So, you know, when you're interviewing someone whose opinions you might not necessarily agree with, how do you manage that situation? Well, it's not... Um, in the style of interviews that I do, I don't think it's my place to agree or disagree with them. I might have those views privately, but it's not my place to judge them. Mm. They might judge me in a certain way. And as an interviewer, you have to give them a platform. So even if I don't necessarily agree with them, what I can do is I can challenge them on various areas. For example, his point that the news always has to kind of teach us something, be worthy, be perhaps a bit uplifting. I think we need some of that, but we also need to tell the world about what is really going on. And that's a pretty good example at the moment with the Nigerian girls. You know, um, admittedly, a lot of news organizations got onto that quite late. But we need to tell the bad stuff as well as the good stuff. So this is, a, this is an opportunity to, to let someone speak their mind, but then you can kind of probe their motivation for their beliefs and what they say. Mm -hmm. And we do have a, a question from the studio audience at the moment. Um, yes, go ahead. So how do you know when a disaster has occurred at that moment? And so um, how you get there so fast? Yep, okay. How do we find out? How do we get the breaking news that we get? Well, um, these days we get breaking news pretty... I mean, it could even be on Twitter or on Facebook. Um, 
or even Instagram, you know, someone is near an accident or a disaster when it happens and they snap the picture. And then I suppose it's up to our media organizations like the ABC to, to work out how, where is that and how do we get someone to that location. Social media is a really great one for this and this has really happened only in the last few years where even emergency services are relying on social media. So if someone, you know, take a bushfire for instance and the fire front is moving very quickly and people don't know where they're supposed to go and how quickly and which roads are closed and, you know, whether it's safe. Um, even um, emergency service organisations are now looking at Twitter and saying, right, someone's reporting a fire there, 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 we need to close that road, which means we need to tell people to go in that direction, not straight into the fire um, inadvertently. So social media is a really great one for that. From our point of view, um, we pay a lot of attention to social media, but it doesn't, you don't necessarily treat it as fact, you treat it as sort of like a tip off. There are a lot of things that appear on social media that are completely untrue and it's, we have to tread that line to make sure that you, know, you don't sort of see something on Twitter or Facebook and go, oh, you know. That's the news. That's that the is news, a really, you know, that's, really yeah. important point because yeah. we love social media. I mean, it's yeah. great in terms of getting the news and uh, access to the audience, but we've seen time and time again when, when breaking news does happen, you know, especially the There's Boston a bombings. Misinformation and, about A lot of people yeah. are so eager to report it that sometimes, you know, it's easy to, to report the facts wrong. So checking that is important. We have a question that's coming from online that I want to put to you guys now. Um, it's from Axe Bain and he asks, do, we, do you guys have any tips for conquering nerves? Um, <laughs> breathe? Do you guys still breathe. get nervous? Do you, do you no, get really, nervous before? I used to look, I, when I went to uni, we mm. had a voice class, which was everyone just completely made fun of at the time and just thought, oh, voice class, you know, <laughs> that's how dull. And then when I started working in the industry, the only thing I could do to calm myself down was to remember what I learned in voice class, lying on the floor and like arms outstretched like this and going, Brrr, you know, <laughs> anything that, that kind of, you know, brings you back to the present and just, you know, and, and literally to breathe, it's such an obvious thing to mm. say, but it works so well because a lot of the time when you are really nervous, you take really short, sharp breaths and you, um, you know, you, you, you kind of let the nerves build. So breathing. That's, that's kind of a big one. Yep. yep. <laughs> Any tips, Jane? Oh, yeah, breathing is important. I think, um, you know, the more you do something, the uh, I, I don't feel nervous now. I feel excited and I'm really glad that you're all here to join us, but I don't feel nervous. And maybe some years ago I would have. I remember one thing that someone taught me though is when you're looking down the, a camera to not think of, oh my goodness, there could be thousands, possibly more than a million people watching me because that is definitely gonna freak you out. I always think of one person at the other end of the camera. And that's a really calming thought that you're just actually talking to someone like a friend. And um, that's a really good way to sort of cut those um, screeches that you hear in the background about, you know, what you're actually doing. I completely agree. That's exactly what I do. Now, talking about nerves, I have to say I was a little bit nervous when I interviewed this, uh, this person. She's a very famous pop star. A lot of you guys might know her. Um, Jessica Mowboy is off to Eurovision to represent Australia there, and I had an opportunity to interview her before she left. Let's take a look. Well, Jess, first of all, massive congratulations on going to Eurovision. I know, it's a bit, it's huge. It's bigger than anything I expected. Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite overwhelming when you think about it. You know, we have so, so much incredible talent. We have so many beautiful artists. And, um, you know, so I think being up there representing means a lot. And I feel very proud and very honoured. And you do come from a fairly musical family, but you've also got a really interesting sort of cultural background mm. because your mum is Indigenous and your dad has yeah, Indonesian. Yeah, culturally, it plays a it, ta it plays a big part, um, you know, having the Indigenous side and growing up in a, in a, in a big Indigenous community, um, you know, it's, 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 it's the way you speak and the way you connect, whether it be, a, you know, an eyebrow gesture. You know, that's how we, we talk back at home. It's, it's, it's a bit of a nod or it's a bit of a, an eyebrow or a certain look. I want to talk to you about your latest song, Never Be The Same. You wrote that and it's a very personal story for you, isn't it? Never be the same is um, is is something that uh, just eases in in my soul and my heart and makes me feel real and and more connected with the music that I write. Uh, but this particular moment, I guess you know, the album was so put together so fast 
And I just come off the back of such an incredible film, The Sapphires. So my headspace, my vibe was still stuck in that Motown world. I was singing Sugar Pie and um, you got to know a pony. Well, before I let you go, I want to hear some more of you. So. Yes. Oh, my goodness. So um, let, can, we, can we hear, you know, a little bit of your latest single or, or whatever oh. you want to leave us with? We're all running in a crazy race. Never think. Staring at a different face, things are never gonna be the same. Beautiful. Now I have shivers. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica you. Malvoy, thank you so much for your time. Always a pleasure. Thanks thank for you. joining us. Well, there you go. That was a very fun interview. I do have to admit, you guys, was, I did have a good time. Someone from Brower College online asked if um, asked one of the, some of the good things about being a journalist. And I reckon that's one of them. You get oh, to meet absolutely. some really cool people. Getting to meet, like yeah. you were saying earlier, getting yeah. to meet people that have really cool jobs. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to turn the tables over to you guys. We want a volunteer who wants to do a live cross with Jeremy Fernandez. Any volunteers? Robert. Okay. Or... Yep. Robert in the front. The okay, so we'll get you to sit just for a moment and while we're setting you up to do the live cross, let's take a look at how Jeremy Fernandez gets ready to read the news. Hello and welcome to the ABC Newsroom. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. I'm one of the presenters here and tonight I'm going to be reading the 7 o'clock news. This is the team. It's a fairly small uh, team that puts together the nightly news. This is Jebby, who's my lineup producer. She's the woman with all the power in the room and decide what goes where and which stories are important, which stories will be in the bulletin which ones won't be. We've only got half an hour, obviously, so we need to uh, sort of make those decisions fairly early on in the day. Come and I'll show you through some of the other um, uh, people who help put the news together. This is George Wood. He's our chief of staff, and he's in charge of assigning all the stories to the various reporters, being in charge of the cameraman, making sure uh, not only are they assigned and they're getting to their jobs on time and coming back, but also that they have their lunch breaks and that they're safe when they're going out to jobs. Uh, we've got our intake editor, John Shovlin, here. John is overseeing some of the uh, uh, stories that are coming in through the network uh, this morning and this afternoon. These start, people start all very early in the day, much earlier than I do. Um, I come in at the end of the day and take care of stuff um, as the bulletin is coming together. Uh, we've got our foreign desk here. Um, they're in charge of pulling all uh, the foreign stories together. This is Glenn Trowbridge, who's the big, big boss of the day, and he's in charge of all the stories that are coming in from around the network. I'll show you through to uh, Master Control. Uh, it's not, not Master Control. This is uh, News Exchange, which is where all the vision is coming through from other parts of the country. Um, so as the stories get recorded and fed around the country, this is where, this is the, uh, the control centre, if you like. This is where uh, the pictures are brought in. This is where pictures from Sydney are sent out to the rest of the network. And at the end of the day, when the stories are all cut and ready to go, um, for instance, we might have a lead politics package. Uh, our, our top story tonight is going to be the crisis in Ukraine. That is going to be a lead story for a lot of the other states around the country. So we will cut it here and we will send it to them as a full package for them to play in their 7 o'clock users around the country. So I'm just about to put down a voiceover for our, a graphics track that we're going to use in the 7 o'clock news tonight. Uh, this will just be so that the graphics artist knows when, uh, how to time the graphics. So next up, it's time for makeup. So we're approaching on air time and I'm just starting to go through the bulletin now to make sure that everything's in order, that the scripts are all looking right and to make any last minute changes. few minutes before on air, come and meet Kevin, he's the director, he's in charge of coding the entire bulletin Thank and you. putting it to air. Um, let's go, hey. And so this is the studio floor, a few cameras that we can choose from. We're going to start tonight's program on the wall, our lead story, the crisis in Ukraine. Okay, stand by Jeremy, ready on camera two. In five, four, three, two, one. Good evening, Jeremy Fernandez with ABC News. As we go to where tonight, the crisis in Ukraine is escalating. 
right, we're going to take a change of pace now. You may have heard on the news today that uh, Graham Arnold is expected to be signed as the new coach of Sydney FC. Now, Graham Arnold won the uh, title, the A-League title, with the Central Coast Mariners a couple of years ago, and we're hearing reports that he's uh, about to sign a three-year contract with the Sky Blues. We're going to get a point of view from the grassroots level. We're joined by 14-year-old Robert Beattie. He's a 14-year-old uh, uh, junior soccer player with uh, Gummy United and the Sutherland FC Youth League. Uh, Robert Beattie, thanks for joining us. Now, I'm curious, what would your advice be to Graham Arnold as he takes on this job? Um, if I was uh, to talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, I would just tell him to keep doing what he's doing and I wouldn't say, don't let people tell you what to do, it's your decision, and just do what you think is right. Um, tell us a bit about your background and, and your aspirations to play soccer. Um, I did start when I was young. I always liked to kick a ball in the backyard with my dad. I started playing in the under sevens. I didn't play in a very good team. I could barely kick a ball, but I, I really enjoyed going every Saturday morning. Um, by my about seventh year, I wanted to do more, so I tried out for my regional youth league at Sutherland, and I actually I got in. And I played my second year. This is my second year this year. And for my original team, Gum United, I'm coming up to my tenth year for playing for them. So how do you um, manage these aspirations, given that you're in high school, you really are still very young, and a lot of it's going to depend on the sort of what happens with your uh, playing career over the next few years. What are you doing to make sure that you get to where you want to be in a few years' time? Um, I'm just always going back to my roots. I go up to the Oval a lot with my friends, and we play games just to have fun, play around. Um, I do want to keep doing school and always do my homework and yeah, stuff like that. Good one. All right, Robert Beattie, we'll leave it there. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. That was fantastic. Very, very well done. Look, it is a lot hard. It is a lot more difficult than it actually looks, isn't it? I what mean, a is star. This, do you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah and well that's done. The thing you sort of you sort of have to think about because you know while we were doing that interview, mm. we were getting time calls and we had um, the floor manager waving her arms at me and saying, "You've got one more question." A lot of a lot of things seconds. are going on, and I'm yeah, getting so that in my ear right now to, to wrap it up. But look, before we go, we do have one more bidding question from our online audience, and it's it's. It's from Monkey Man who's asked, what's the funniest story you guys have ever reported? <laughs> oh, Quickly. I, I think mine would have had to have been the biggest mooncake that had ever been baked. Yeah, it wasn't that funny really, but I thought it was pretty Sounds funny. Sounds cute. I, um, I burst out laughing on air once and I just couldn't stop because <laughs> there was a story about a plane that had to be evacuated in Melbourne because someone had farted. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a bit of toilet humour to kind of, you know, okay, lighten great. the mood. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's fantastic. Look, thank you both so much for your time and your insights today. And thanks to our wonderful studio audience. Thanks, you guys, for all the great questions we got. Well, that's all we have time for today. We'll see you next time on ABC Splash Live.